Uh, Father, we do thank you that you speak to us through your living, active word. And we thank you for this opportunity at the beginning of this day to gather in this way. And we thank you that as we read your word together, you have promised to speak to us. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would bring us comfort and hope from your word as we come to the Lord Jesus. We pray it in his name. Amen. Well, how have you found the news over the last week? You've been, uh, been swayed by the news, uh, not of who won Bathurst. I'm guessing this is not that crowd. <laughs> Love to talk to other people, but no, that's, that's not a... But there's other news that's big news for us, right? Other news. I mean, the things going on with uh, Andrew Thorburn and... Uh, how has that news affected your demeanour? How has it affected your attitude, your mood? How has it affected the way that you've related to others? Has it even perhaps affected your sense of who you are, your identity? How do you feel about being called a bigot? Has the realisation sunk in that because of your association with the Anglican Church, you will no longer be able to be the CEO of an AFL team. <laughs> Might not have been an ambition of yours, but it was nice to have the option open, wasn't it? <laughs> How does this news impact us? How does the news change who we are and how we think about ourselves? How does the news affect our hope? Now, in the last few months, I've spoken to doctors, psychologists, uh, to lawyers and bankers, amongst others, who have told me that they are scared for their jobs if people at work realise what they believe. And I've got to say, to my great shame, I have not engaged with the depth of that until this last week. Are you like me? It's actually much easier to be set aside as a full-time gospel worker than to be trying to work in secular Australia living for the Lord Jesus. How has that impacted you? How does the news impact you? Over the last three weeks of our year together, I am going to speak three times about hope. Why? Well, because one of the perks of being on the faculty here is you can choose whatever you want to talk about. <laughs> and I need to think about Christian hope. I need it. Because especially over the last few years, I have felt my hope recede. I have felt more overwhelmed by anxiety by worry, overcome with difficulties and pains in life and I need to be reminded of the Christian hope. Are you like me? Do you need that? Um, hope's a bit like apple pie, everybody's in favour of it, but what is it? Why is it good? What's the substance of it? We might even be able to say quite a lot about it. We might be able to argue a case for it. But are you hopeful? Would other people describe you as a hopeful person? Is your life full of hope? Do, hope, do words of hope regularly spring from your ma um, mouth? Do thoughts of hope occupy your spare waking moments? Do you dream of hope? Are you a hopeful person? Over these talks, I want to turn the volume down on the noise of the world and the volume up as we draw close to the God of all hope. Three talks. Today, uh, we're going to start by looking backwards and exploring the sure ground of Christian hope. Uh, next week, we're going to look outwards and think about what it might um, mean to be identified as a person of hope. Uh, and in the final week, we're going to finish looking forward uh, to the great hope of the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, first, then, looking backwards. Into a world uh, where hope is little more than wishful thinking, where a desire to be healthier and wealthier and more successful in the few years we have left 
is about all there is for many of our friends and neighbours to hope for. In a world where religious hope is considered an illusion, an opiate, a drug to dull the pain, a lie we tell one another to make us feel better, a dangerous lie now. Into this chaos, into this confusion, into this depression, in the midst of all of this, hear the living God speak. Turn up, 1 Corinthians 15. What does God's word tell us? One Corinthians fifteen. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you've received and on which you've taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise you've believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Kephas and then to the Twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the Apostles, and last of all, He appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I'm the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach and this is what you believed. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we are found to be false witnesses about God for we have testified about God that he did raise Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. This morning I want to uh, skim through this whole chapter with you um, and I want to think with you about the sure ground of Christian hope and consider the impact that this foundation has on your hope. Jesus' resurrection and ours. That's what we're looking at. In verses 3 to 8 of the chapter there's a summary of the gospel, the announcement of God's Messiah King, the proclamation that makes the difference of life and death to every person in the world. A simple four-point message. Jesus died for our sins, was buried, was raised on the third day, appeared to Kephas the Twelve, James the Apostles and Paul. It's a simple message. Makes clear claims about what happened. They're fact claims. They're not abstract or philosophical ideas The history of these things matter. If they didn't happen, Christian hope evaporates like a mist. And I know that you know them. I know that none of this is is new. But as you sit here this morning, are you truly convinced of the truth claims behind that simple four-point gospel message? Are you convinced that these things that Paul passed on as of primary importance, actually happened. And even if you are convinced, when was the last time you took time to dwell on them, to think about them, to turn them over in your mind? So if you're anything like me, these truths can easily drift into the background as the busyness of life takes over. (laughs) 
Just bring the resurrection of the Lord Jesus back to the foreground of your mind for a few minutes now. Let's dwell on what happened on the sure and certain ground of Christian hope. Look with me and we'll see the difference that all of this makes. I'm not going to take time to rehearse the evidence. At the time that Paul uh, wrote this letter, more than 500 people had seen a dead man come back to life about 20 years earlier. They had not forgotten it and he wrote saying, you can go and check it out if you like. Most of them are still alive. He was not arguing for the history of the thing. But for Paul and for the Corinthians, the fact that these things happened, that's not in dispute. It's the implications. What does that therefore mean? That Jesus rose for your resurrection, for your eternal life, for your hope. Knowing the facts of what happened to Jesus, that's the grounds of Christian hope because his resurrection is a guarantee of your resurrection. His resurrection is a first fruits of your resurrection. If he did not rise, neither will you. And that's why it's a sure and certain ground, the history um, that, that Paul assumed that the people uh, in Corinth were able to check out because they were there at that time. When Australians speak at funerals about their loved ones drifting on the clouds, looking down at them. I know why people talk like that. Because it's, well, it's a nice idea. It's, it's of some comfort, a time of terrible tragedy where people who have no connection to anything beyond the imminent world around them that they see and touch like to imagine that there's something else. But the resurrection of Jesus screams out something very different and so much better. Look at verse 12. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, there's no chance anyone else will rise from the dead either. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, preaching the gospel and believing the gospel is useless, verse 14. If it only makes you feel good now, if it only brings comfort now, that is of no use. Worse than that, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, the gospel is a lie, verses 15 and 16, and preachers are telling lies about God when they preach it, and I'm telling lies right now. If Jesus did not rise from the dead. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, it does not matter what you believe or how hard you believe it. Verses 17 and 18, you are still trapped in your sins with all of the consequences that come with that. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, verse 19, we Christians are of all people most to be pitied. Saving faith puts confidence in the resurrection of Jesus. If we only have hope for this life, for here and now, we are more to be pitied than anyone else. A version of Christianity without the physical resurrection of Jesus is hopeless. It's hopeless. Without the resurrection of Jesus, we may as well, verse 32, just eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Enjoy life because that's it. That's the best you can hope for. So many Australians pin their hopes and joys to experiences to buying nice things, to, to owning your own place, to chasing the latest fashions, the great body, the adrenaline rush, your best life now, for tomorrow we die. And that's it. And brothers, I want to say, don't deride that. Don't write that off. Because if Jesus did not rise from the dead, that is the best that there is on offer. That is all that there is to hope for. But listen to verse 20. 
1 Corinthians 15, 20, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. You see, the point is that Jesus did rise from the dead. And he did it as the first of many, of any, who would trust in him. The resurrection of Jesus happened and therefore the hope of the resurrection is sure and certain. There's all kinds of details we could explore in the verses that follow. Um, But the point is, Christian hope uh, of life beyond the grave is a physical hope. It's a physical hope tied to physical bodies. We will be raised bodily. Our resurrection bodies are connected to the bodies we have now, but glorious, glorious. You will be you in the new creation. Somehow I don't, you'll be you, you'll have your body. And the Bible tells you even now that your body is beautiful. It is uh, uh, is fearfully and wonderfully made. Uh, It is made in the image of the living God. It's the same kind of body that Jesus took on. It's it's a dignified... this, This is good. But the resurrection body will be glorious. So much better. Never again to be sick or tired or broken or perishable. Verse 42... So it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable, but it's raised imperishable. It's sown in dishonour, it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness, it's raised in power. It's sown a natural body, it's raised a spiritual body. So we will be raised physically, but the weak, the broken, the sinful things will be taken away and overcome with holy and glorious and sinless godlikeness. Because at its heart, the Christian hope, eternal life, is not the hope of an extra innings. It's not just the hope of more of this. It's not the hope of a longer life or a life that lasts forever. It is a radically new life where the perishable is raised imperishable and the sinful raised glorious. All of the ugliness that comes with sin, including death itself, will be done away with forever. So the resurrection pins our hopes to a life beyond the grave. But because our hopes are firmly pinned to a life beyond the grave, that changes completely how we engage with the world today as well. Life this side of the grave. See, if we know that tomorrow we die is not the end of the story, then we can let go of things that we would otherwise have to pin our hopes to. We can let those priorities go. And we can take hold of priorities that would otherwise make no sense at all. But that there is life beyond the grave. If there is nothing beyond this, if we die and that's it, then we have to chase every last pleasure, every last experience, every last desire, every last validation from others. But if we can live with the sure and certain hope of heaven, we don't need to be dogged by fearing that we're going to miss out on those things now. The frantic life of racking up the most money and the most toys and the most pleasure and everything I can for myself for me to be the best me that I can be and that's it, is utterly transformed by the resurrection of Jesus and by the hope of our own resurrection. 
Have you been consumed, brothers, by the news of today? Have you been made to feel over the last few days, over the last week, that all is at stake? That the church is under threat? That it's fragile? Perhaps you've been made to feel fearful, anxious about what others think about us, about you, about what they might say. These horrible, petty, small-minded, hypocritical, tiny people. As enemies of ours. But what if we were consumed by different news? What if that was not the news that consumed our lives? What if it was the news of the resurrection of Jesus? How would that change this week, this experience? If we have a sure and certain hope, we have no reason to be afraid. No reason to be afraid by being insulted or belittled or even sacked or imprisoned or killed. To live is Christ and to die is gain. Do you believe it? Brothers, you sang it 16 times earlier. T- <laughs> Out loud, I heard it. But I I do want to ask you, do you actually believe it? To live is Christ and to die is gain. What if we actually believed it? What if the news of the resurrection of Jesus was the big news that transformed my perspective on the world? What would that look like? How would I see those who shout and condemn? Well, talk about sheep without a shepherd. Talk about people who live without God and without hope in the world. Talk about people who need to be loved, who need to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus. I've found myself this week just kind of rising up and noticing I'm clenching my jaw and thinking about all the things I'd love to say. Or actually, I'm, frankly, all the things I wish somebody else would say. <laughs> and it's not being driven out of love and it's not being driven out of fear and it's not being driven out of a concern to see the other people come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus. To my shame. And it's a wonderful thing to focus on the sure and certain hope that we have in the resurrection of Jesus because it utterly transforms how I look at and live my life here and now. Don't you want to be among those who preach the very good news of the Lord Jesus into this hopeless world? What an extraordinary privilege to be counted among those. Isn't that the news that drives your life? In this chapter, Paul calls on the Corinthians to respond to the news they have heard of the resurrection by, in the first few verses, believing, taking a stand, holding firmly to this gospel. In verse 34, he says more abruptly, come to your senses, snap out of it, stop sinning. And in verse 58 he writes, therefore my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm, let nothing move you, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labour in the Lord is not in vain. Do you see that? Do you see that the resurrection hope, the giving of ourselves over fully, to the work of the Lord is purposeful and it makes a difference and it is never in vain. Even in the face of death, this work lasts. Standing firm in the gospel, proclaiming the gospel, making much of Jesus, helping others to take hold of, to cling to him, to cling to the hope of the resurrection. That work 
That work is never in vain. We're not there yet. What we hope for has not yet arrived. But our future hope changes everything here and now. It's not a vague hope. It's not a fragile hope. It's not an unexplored or unexplained hope. It is a sure and certain hope. It is a hope grounded in historical fact, a hope grounded in what the prophets had foretold, a hope grounded in the person and particularly the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And it is a hope that transforms life here and now. Here again these words from the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Listen, I'll tell you a mystery. We'll not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For the imperishable must clothe itself with the... Sorry, for the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will, be, will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of, law is the, uh, power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labour in the Lord is never in vain.